try to like give you a general or, or general and a bit uh, idea and a bit more details about like the different numerical techniques that are used to really simulate uh, yeah, the dynamical phase of common envelopes. Um, I'm not going so so much into the actual simulations that will be the talk uh, after coffee, but I really try to like look at the different schemes and how they are different and what's potentially uh, advantages and disadvantages of using them for common envelopes. Um, as always with these things, like there rarely is like a scheme that's really optimal for everything. So it's like good to know where, where which which things are like more trustworthy or more accurate in some schemes that are good. Uh, a little bit careful with uh, also I think the background in terms of like hydro, sim hydro simulations and uh, details of working schemes and so on is like quite diverse here in the uh, audience so uh, feel free to interrupt me whenever there's um, anything unclear or you want like more detailed information about something that we said go into more detail okay so just to set the stage what what do we actually want and so the basic system of equations that we are solving is in like, yeah, in, in its most simple form, a combination of the Euler equations for hydrodynamics and the Poisson equations for Sandra. And uh, there are different ways of solving them. We want we need to solve them numerically. We make the system so nonlinear that essentially for something like a binary tool like in the, if you really want to like look at like yeah, the detailed internal evolution, it's completely, or it's reasonably hopeless to try to do this another day. Okay. Um, of course, the ideal code that we would like to have is, uh, of course, accurate. Like, it doesn't really like, help us much if, the, if, the, if we don't get the correct, whatever that means, result. Uh, we want it to be stable. This is uh, maybe a slightly less obvious <coughs> point, but uh, that's often, uh, like, so, there's often some kind of trade-off between like how accurate your code is and like uh, how stable it is under like general circumstances. Um, of course, we want it to be efficient so that we can run long simulations with very high resolution, um, which we will see in a second is in particular uh, important for the common envelopes. Ideally, we want it to be scalable so we can run it on like many cores so that it doesn't take that long. Um, also, these two things usually have a little bit of a trade-off in practice. So, the, the, like, it's much harder to get a very fast code to scale well than to get a code that is slightly slower to at least scale well with more <coughs> uh, The interesting thing is that, like, if you write, if you write a computing care proposal, it's almost completely about like how scalable your code is, and not how fast it is in absolute terms, because this you can actually show. While this is some kind of like absolute criteria, and there's essentially no way that computing centers judge, can judge like whether your code is like fast or slow in, in, in absolute terms. And then one thing that is like much more important in practice is because like for most of the simulations you need to modify your code somewhere, and so ideally you want want a code that's like reasonably easy to understand, to use, and also to extend, so to add additional source terms, additional physics modules. And Okay, of course, I think it's reasonably obvious that we have nothing that's like perfect in all of these points, so you always have to take some compromises. So I will try to like go through what the properties of the different main techniques are and um, how they. Okay, just very quick outline of the talks. I will first give some very general characterizations of uh, um, common envelope simulations, like what we are dealing with in terms of uh, scales for the things we can actually run on the computer right now, not necessarily for the thing that would be, we would want to do in the optimal case. And then I will go through the three main methods that are, that are used today for, to run common envelope simulations that are a smooth particle hydrodynamics, um, codes, static mesh, or more specific AMR codes, and uh, moving mesh codes. And then there are very okay. Um, let's look at the simulations and so I've, I've taken these numbers from Sebastian Ullmann simulations uh, but like this is uh, they're, yeah, they're very a little bit with, depending on which type of star and which type of system you run but like as a rule of thumb I think they're already a good uh, pointer so if you look at this 
Can you actually see anything with the conscious? Okay. So if you if you look at the simulation that was run until 120 seconds um, from the beginning of the of the um, yeah from the setup, then at the end of the simulation where you see that like so this is this is the roughly the size of the envelope, and then if you zoom in, you see the two cores uh, quite close together here. Then the size of the envelope is like 500 solar radii here, and the distance between the two cores is a few solar radii. Um, at the end of the simulation, the softening, the gravitational softening, that's the that's the the, um, the scale on which you um, kind of deviate from the one over r potential of the um, of the course, so that you don't get like a, that you don't uh, get an infinitely large force in the center, um, is uh, one solar radius here, and you actually have to like or one thing that we found out in these simulations is that you actually have to resolve the scale by quite a few cells to um, get accurate results, in particular to uh, make sure that energy is conserved reasonably, reasonably well. And so I will come back to this point later. Um, so the radius of the smallest cell here, which is like a not very meaningful quantity, but it gives you a rough idea how far this, how far down this goes, is uh, about a hundred of a solar. So if you compare this number now to this number, then you see that like the typical dynamical range of in, 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 uh, in length scales of such a simulation is like 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 orders of magnitude. And this immediately tells you that you can't run this with a just uniform constant resolution because then you would like a, need a mesh that's like 10 to the 5 cubed or so. And so you, you need some kind of adaptive resolution and you can figure out how to exactly do if you, the, the second interesting question and like that often comes they, they often come together is but it's on, but they are like still slightly different and have like different uh, or slightly different reasons is uh, time scales so of course if you have like very large scales and very small scales then also the, 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 the kind of time scale on which these things change and in which you need to evolve these cells is very different but the kind of Kind of baseline that's interesting is of course the total simulation time in this case uh, the 120 days then the smallest time step so the time step in general is uh, of course determined by the size of the step of the cell and, and the kind of signal velocity in the cell which is in a repo just the sound speed so these cells are like the like in the very center close to the course and so the smallest time step times uh, time step there is of the order is like a few seconds you do, i think check this about two seconds that means that to get to this 120 days in the simulation, you already need to advance your simulation by roughly 2 million time steps, which is uh, already quite significant. Um, just as for like a for rough compars comparison of orders of magnitude, like the, the most expensive cosmological simulations we are running, we can do like 20 million times, uh, 20 million time steps or so, which is like only slight, only factor of 10 more than this. So this is already quite hard to do, like doing a few million time steps. Um, yeah, so the simulation um, has, uh, yeah, the specific simulation has uh, 2.7 million cells. What's interesting is that half a million of them, which is quite a significant fraction, actually is on rather small time steps. So they're just, like, it's all, uh, that are smaller than 16 seconds, uh, while all, kind of the rest of the, whatever, about 2 million cells at our time set, like this is mostly then the background cells here, are on time sets that are way larger, so they don't really contribute that much for the total effort you need to do in the simulation. It's really mostly the, the stuff on those time steps that are like close to the to the course where you need to resolve the inner, the, the, uh, the inner binary and the the, the, uh, yeah, the region between them. Um, what's uh, yeah, just to give you a rough number, so this simulation with uh, run with the repo uh, cost us uh, 200,000 CPU hours. Um, what's interesting is, so this, this uh, kind of, I mentioned it indirectly here, so in a repo every cell is kind of evolved in the, uh, uh, to zero of order evolved on, its, on the time step that's required for the cell, so with like a local core criterion. And if we do a rough estimate on how much uh, be safe with this for this type of simulation, then we can estimate like if we would ever evolve everything on like the 
happens. And also, it's on the smallest time step in the simulation, which would be roughly this two seconds, then it would be roughly a factor of 10 more expense. So running these type of simulations, because the time hierarchy, time hierarchy and the spatial hierarchy are so deep, you actually can gain a lot from um, not doing just one global uh, time step. For it. But uh, yeah, we will come to this in, uh, in a minute, but almost all the simulation uh, codes now, nowadays support this. And then, um, last but not least, there is not only hydrodynamics and gravity, but there, are, like we have talked uh, at length at, uh, about these things already, there's um, different uh, additional physics, physical processes that we, in principle, would like to model that make the whole life much more complicated. That's radiation transport, that's magnetic fields, that's dust. And um, I will come back to this a few times. Um, it's quite, like, it seems to be quite important that we make sure that actually angular momentum, in particular total energy, are conserved. Because if you like, we have, to, we have uh, mentioned this yesterday a few times. If you get like this, the unbinding is often seems to be quite marginal. And so, if you have an energy error to end an error in the total energy of like 10, 20, 30 percent or so, that can be more than what you still need to unbind your envelope, right? And what does your result actually mean? Okay. Um, what's quite interesting in this field is that there's like a wide variety of codes used to run these common envelope simulations. Um, that's uh, it's just like some sub subset of recent uh, simulations, so I uh, don't claim completeness here. Um, but uh, like there are the different SKH simulations, there are uh, with different codes, there are different uh, AMR simulations, and now, now there are the also recent uh, moving mesh simulations. It's kind of an alternative to these uh, traditional AMR SKH Okay, so let's look at like these three types of um, numerical schemes a little bit more. So let's look at first at smooth, smooth particle hydrodynamics. So here, well, first there are like, well, one of the one of the things why, well, there are many reasons to use SVH, but one of the reasons is definitely that there are, that there are actually quite a number of efficient codes publicly available <coughs> that you can just download and set up your own SVH simulation and run it. Um, so how does this work? SVH is a, is a Lagrangian scheme. So what you do is you discretize the mass of your object into particles, and then you evolve the particles from the forces that by the forces that act on the particle, which for the Lagrangian scheme are pressure, force, and gravity. Um, the yeah, so you uh, discretize it this into, part, uh, into particles. So one of the very nice properties of SPH should also make them quite attractive here is that SPH essentially inherently conserves total angular momentum and total energy perfect. Okay. The, um, the reason why it conserves total angular momentum perfectly is like, at least qualitatively you can think about is that the, all the forces between the particles are isotropic. And so that, um, which is not the case usually in mesh codes, so that uh, kind of so because of this, you essentially have no deviation list and don't lose anything here. And the conservation of total energy, in contrast to the other codes, is mostly a consequence that you can actually couple the hydro forces and the gravity forces kind of perfectly. Yes? But does that also include now, if you want to include radiation transport or magnetic fields? This is, well, this is, well, this is first for, like, for hydrodynamics plus gravity. Right. If you, as soon as you have like any explicit sync terms, of course you don't right. convert. Uh, you don't conserve it anymore. Um, if you add magnetic fields, which is tricky in SPH, but have like a, one two or two remarks later for this, um, it's in principle still like depends on how you exactly do that. But in principle, there's no necessarily no necessary reason to be not conserved. But the, we come, we come to this with the grid codes, but the, the, the kind of the, con, the conservation of total energy comes from the, from the fact that essentially you just calculate pressure forces and gravitational forces, and you just apply them the exact same way, and so the whole thing is like uh, consistent. Um, the, it's also, uh, the code is also exactly Galilean invariant, it's a Lagrangian method. If your whole boost, the whole system doesn't change. Yeah, the coupling to gravity is straightforward. You just calculate in addition to pressure forces with your SVH scheme, you uh, calculate um, gravity forces. And because you, so the way this works is you have these like 
mass particles, and they usually you, you give them all the same mass. And so then when there, there are more particles in some area, do it, uh, like you have a higher density there, you have more resolution. And if, like in under dense regions, you just have fewer particles. So the, 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 in the yeah, you have fewer particles in low density regions, and you have less resolution. So this whole thing is uh, intrinsically adaptive to density, which for common envelope res uh, simulations is at least the first order a quite nice feature. So we have like a, a lot of resolution in the center where it has the highest density and less than the, uh, resolution in the outskirts where uh, the, yeah, where less is going. And yeah, so this is just a schematic um, kind of picture of how you calculate these forces. So the smooth particle hydrodynamics name comes from the fact that to calculate like pressure forces, you kind of have a spherical kernel and you, you sum up the contributions from, like a, you do a weighted sum of the contributions of all neighbors within a certain radius. And then you choose this radius such that the number of other particles in this radius are always roughly the same. So you automatically, if, you're, if, they're, if they're further apart in a lower density region, you, go, you like smooth over larger scales. And on, in a high density region, you smooth over smaller scales. And so yeah, this uh, is then you just call this the radius of this thing. And so this is then also, this is the typical kind of scale on which your hydro quantities are well defined. So the having higher resolution and higher density gives you make a lot of sense, but the part of our observations are sensitive are uh, possibly actually in the low density regions. And I'm wondering, uh, is there freedom to uh, reallocate resolution to places where the observational consequences are strong? So this is, this is actually one of the downsides of this method that's like very hard and in practice, I think, almost never done because the artifacts you get from this are dominating the usually over the gain you potentially have. So this thing is adaptive to density, but usually only to density. Principally, you could think about like splitting particles, emerging particles, but like I think people have tried this a little bit, but it has never worked well enough to actually. It's usually done by, by imposing the initial mass resolution with the smallest particles at the place where you want to resolve the best of that particle. I mean, for example, we have 10 and 4 back and mass resolution also, you have to be careful. So you can, in principle, vary the mass resolution slowly, but you have to be really careful that you don't get situations where particles of different mass are like close together, because then this this like this weighted sum here is like gets can get like very one-sided to the massive particles or so, and you can actually also create. Them. So that's by in most cases you can maybe the very massive factors of a few, but you wouldn't like you usually people. I was wondering, are you going to say anything about initial conditions for SPH? I mean, the um, stability uh, of an initial uh, model depends <coughs> a lot on how you choose the positions. And right. So no, I, did, I hadn't planned this, but so yeah. So this is um, tricky in SPH as well because you need like so the to get you kind of um, yeah. Well, let's come to, back to this in a minute because I think there are two more things that come. Okay. So you do this like averages over the smoothing lengths to calculate. Right? Um, so now there are some also significant downsides of this method, but like, um, it's in general like, very stable. Um, one problem with the Lagrangianness of the method is that it's, there's also like the method, the, like the, the kind of simple implementation of the method does not have any way to produce to increase the entropy in shocks, for example. And so what you need to increase, what you need to introduce is a so-called artificial viscosity where you try to heuristically detect shocks and then add entropy there. And you not only need this for, for shocks, but you also need this for stability because you always need some non-zero viscosity in any hydrocode, otherwise it doesn't. The problem is that it's very hard to um, figure or to like do this artificial viscosity such that it really exactly only triggers where you want, right? Because that's, and so this means that leads to the, the problem that you always tend to like dissipate slightly more in regions where you don't really want to and where there's not really anything going on. Um, there are also like nowadays a million way to, ways to do this and you can go to like very complicated like attempts to, to um, find your shocks here. Um, yeah, the problem, but yeah, there's essentially no, you can't do this without like 
There's no perfect way of that you can play with this a lot. Uh, then a second kind of fundamental issue that also comes to the back to the initial conditions problem is there's always significant noise on the scale of the kernel, like on the scale of this smoothing length. Because on the like to to some level the particle this the, 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 the particle integration has some properties of a, of a Monte Carlo integration. It's a, it's a little bit better because the, these particles uh, like move with the flow, so it's like a, it's they are kind of there where you want to have them. But there's still a significant amount of noise left, and you see this a little bit. So this is a Kelvin Hamilton stability. Uh, you see this a little bit. But the contrast is bad here, where like the, the, you just get some uh, amount of intrinsic noise in the simulations. That's very hard to beat up. And there's in general. Uh, there's because the, the, the method is really purely Lagrangian, there's no mixing between particles, which sometimes can be relevant if you have uh, different uh, abundances or so. Um, yeah, one thing that's, uh, that has been mentioned before that's actually um, quite, uh, quite convenient in, in SPH is that it actually allows for true vacuum boundaries. You can essentially just have your particle distribution end somewhere, and then beyond this is a vacuum. Um, this also, or one thing that helps you is that like SPH has a significant amount of surface tension usually, or not significant, but has some amount of surface tension that helps you to keep this boundary stable so you won't like just fling out individual particles usually. Um, however, the problem is that like the quantities you estimate <coughs> at the boundary, and Natasha showed this yesterday a little bit, are often just not overly physical because this. If you look at back at, at this at this kernel, right? If you at some point just don't have anything on on one side, right? You essentially do a completely one-sided estimate of all your quantities, and uh, even though it's stable, you can't like you can't trust the the, the hydro quantities that you get there. Um, one very convenient result is that SBH has traditionally shown to give like very good results even for rather poor resolution. Um, one, of, uh, one of the problems is that it generally converges very slowly. So even though at poor resolution you already get like qualitatively reasonable results, you have to really massively inc increase your so your resolution to really improve the results. Yes. So I, I mean I definitely agree with that, of course. Um, but um, but the number of particles in the kernel, I think, you don't want to increase that necessarily. Daniel Price has a nice description of. Uh, you know, in his review of the, I think uh, I think people have argued about this point a lot, and we can continue this. So I I would argue that for formal convergence, at least, you also need to go to infinite number of particles in the kernel. But this is like formal convergence of SPH is actually a very tricky problem. Like, and this is a very different to the, all the mesh codes where you can usually reasonably straightforward show okay. convergence. I think it was shown that formal convergence is not achievable. I think I think yeah okay like I think I think yeah it's, it's a long complicated topic how like to which degree SPH actually converges with it. so keep in mind it's like really it's it's very good at like slow resolutions but like you like it's you have much less of a gain usually by just increasing a particular and it turns out it's in practice actually quite hard to like uh, add additional physics like magnetic fields or radiation transport. Um, partly because uh, of how you um, define hydro quantities like the temperature. It's not completely trivial, trivial whether you smooth them or take those particle values. And the noise on the mesh scale that you always have kind of makes life with magnetic fields very hard. Um, this noise is also kind of one of the bigger problems with, uh, the, with the initial conditions. So you really need to like ideally a very regular initial particle distribution that you usually also have to damp for a while to really get like uh, what, to get a stable kind of hydrostatic initial um, yeah initial connection. Sorry. That's true. <coughs> okay. So much about SPH. Then let's uh, quickly look at like the kind of yeah. other very widely used method here. That's a uh, static mesh or AMR codes. Also here there are, there's like a, there's a, quite a number of codes here to choose from. Um, many of them are open source, so uh, you can just download them uh, and 
by Giovanni Owens and Nish. Um, the idea of the AMR adaptive mesh refinement is that you, well, all these codes discretize the volume into cells, so it's like a, it's like a volume discretization, not the mass discretization that we had in SPH. And so the, the adaptive mesh refinement now means that you, like, depending on essentially any criteria, you decide that you have, like, that you split a larger cell into four smaller cells, and you can then do this in, princi in principle recursively until you, and depending on how much resolution you are and how much effort you're doing. So. Um, yeah, so this, uh, yeah, this is a finite, usually the, you interpret implement what's called a finite volume scheme. So in the volume of the cells, you track conserved hydro quantities, the mass, the momentum, and the total energy, and then you evolve them with Riemann solvers by calculating for every time step how much of this conserved quantity flows from one cell. Um, yeah, so the effective mesh just splits the cells. Usually these, uh, these uh, AMR codes are, or what you implement there is a second order scheme, so that the, um, that the, <coughs> that the result, or that the solution should in principle converge uh, quadratically with the, uh, or the, the, the error should like go down quadratically with the, with the resolution. Uh, in contrast to um, the SPH, you can essentially refine on any arbitrary criteria. But you can refine on density, and it's definitely an interesting refinement criteria for common envelope simulations. But for example, you can also refine on the pressure gradient or on the density gradient, or just on the very outer layer of your simulation if you're interested in uh, the optical display. And so you can like, more specifically put more precisely put resolution. <laughs> um, the uh, coupling with gravity is a bit more tricky, and this is where, in my experience, usually the biggest error in the, in the conservation of total energy comes from. And that's, uh, yeah, that's technically coming from the fact that you, yeah, the, or the question is like, how do you exactly couple the gravitational forces to your hydrodynamic solver? And so, uh, in the end, there's like some yeah, there, are, there are a few uh, ways to look at this. One of them is that if you do if you do the gravitational forces and then have a hydrodynamics flux from one cell to another cell that's, that carries <coughs> mass, then the potential of this mass changes from the hydroflux, but you do not compensate for this in the energy, right? So like suddenly the mass that that went from from one cell to another is in a different is like in a different place in your gravitational potential. But there's usually no compensation for, for this potential energy that you gained or lost, right? So if you have like systematic outflows or inflows, you actually will have some kind of uh, systematic error. And you can, again, so the whole thing should converge at second order, so that should, in principle, go down with resolution. But that can quickly get quite expensive, depending on the problem. So, um, one other thing with AMR that's a little bit of a problem, I think no, not so much for common envelope simulations, but like I guess AMR experts can tell more about this, is that sometimes you, like, it's, uh, the way that the refinement works is you kind of hit some criterion that you now want better resolution, and then you refine. Right? But then you already kind of were in a state where your resolution was poorer than you would have liked it there. Right? And so, you can you can try to like kind of do this um, then more aggressively to just refine earlier, but this of course makes your simulation significantly more expensive. Yes. I mean, usually, you just refine based on guard cell or uh, ghost cell information as well as the interior of a. Right. Yeah. I think this is mostly this is mostly uh, uh, a difference to kind of the next the moving mesh, where the main difference is that the, the kind of the. Usually, the, the, in the, the part or the, the, the cells already come with the interesting stuff. So, you still do refinement on top of this, but the refinement is kind of a little bit earlier. This is mostly, like in cosmology, this is a much bigger problem. Uh, and one thing that's at least a, like a caveat is usually at these boundaries of the resolution, where you have a larger cell that like, has a boundary to a smaller cell. Um, Actually, the uh, the scheme is not second order anymore, so it drops to first, <coughs> which uh, doesn't matter too much if these bound if the, these uh, kind of resolution boundaries are few and far apart. 
but if you actually like refine a lot in the center or so, and you have lots of these resolution boundaries, you can actually lose quite some cues. Uh, it's also obviously not Galilean invariant um, because you have like one preferred frame, which is the left frame where the, where start, where the mesh sits. Um, what's interesting is that there's like one kind of more subtle difference that comes from this compared to the Lagrangian methods is that your time step, not a kind of like your, the, or the main type step criteria of a Korak criteria asks like how fast can tr information travel over the cell. And so for, for, for a static mesh code, this, the fastest velocity with which it can travel is the sound speed plus the absolute velocity of the gas in the left frame. Now, in the Lagrangian code, where the resolution element moves with the flow, it's just the sound speed. So um, the kind of the, your time step that you get here, if you have a significantly supersonic flow or sonic or supersonic flow, can actually be significantly smaller than if you had a Lagrangian. Okay. For common envelopes, again, this is like not a huge effect because usually the flows are subsonic or sonic. You don't have like any really strong supersonic <coughs> outflows or so, but you can. This can still give you a factor of two or so in terms, of so, which for more expensive simulations can yeah, help if you if you're faster or can make it. Um, yeah, so the, so this I already said already. One of the nice things is that actually the, the just generally additional terms because of the regularity of the mesh are from all the three methods by far the easiest to, to add, right? Like so, uh, whether it's like magnetic fields and like different solvers or radiation transport or so, um, usually it has, it's implemented in, in AMR first and it's actually the most stable and reasonably straightforward to implement it there compared to its speed. Or okay. Then, last but not least, moving mesh. So, <laughs> moving mesh is kind of to a degree in between the, the static mesh and the speed mesh. Um, there's, only, there's only very few codes until now. Uh, there's a repo, there's a bridge. Uh, and there's now Manga, um, which I think the 2D version is open source and the 3D is available on request. Everything is open source, just different branches. Hmm? Everything is open source, just different branches. Okay, okay. But I, I, I only checked the master branch. It was yeah, that's right. Okay, so this is open source and Arapo will actually be open source in a few weeks. So we have a kind of a code paper for the public release, almost good. And the, the, the public version of the code that will be released is actually written. Uh, so, what's the difference here? So, this is also again like in the MR course, it's a Eulerian discretization, so you discretize the volume, but you don't discretize, like the cell doesn't like stay where it is, but it moves with the flow. And so, this is <coughs> done here using a uh, so called unstructured Voronoi mesh, and so the main, or the main, Important property of this Voronoi mesh here is that it's like that it's spanned up by a set of mesh generating points, and so these mesh. So the, the main kind of definition of this, or the definition of the Voronoi mesh is that for every, like every of these mesh generating points spans up a single cell, and all the volume that's closest to this mesh generating point compared to any other point belongs to the cell. Okay, and so the the important, or the kind of the, the main reason why, why this, uh, like, so people have tried to, to do like kind of moving mesh codes in the past, but the main reason why the breakthrough came with the Voronoi mesh was that the mesh actually changes continuously. You can see this here for 2D Kelvin Hamilton instability. You see how the, in the like, like, so here you, you have a shear flow, and you see how at the shear flow, the, the, the cells slowly shear against each other and change in a smooth way. So while kind of most or almost all of the things that people have tried decades before to get this to work, they usually had the problem that at some point the, either the, the mesh would change like kind of spontaneously and then you would have to do some kind of explicit remapping or it was very hard to keep the cells roughly round because in principle 
they become it can become uh, elongated, and then the whole the accuracy of the of your hydro server of like just drops a lot because the yeah like a cell at one part of at one end of the cell is very far away in one direction and not so much in the other. It's, it's uh, yeah it just like like formally you will still have the same order, but like the absolute error increases a lot, and so uh, a lot of like black magic. Uh, goes into like how to move around these mesh children and points such, such that the cells also yeah. always stay roughly wrong. Um, yeah, so the, the main idea is that you that the cells adapt like adapt to and move with the flow. So the, the basic velocity with which you move these mesh training points that span up the cells is just the flow velocity. I show this again. And then on top of this you have some correctional velocity that you kind of do to make to try to make the to keep the meshes the, the cells of the meshes wrong. Are, are there some subgrids here because uh, cells have seem to have different. So, so this is just so this is essentially just taking the gradient. So this is the, just showing density, and so this just takes the the, the 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 density gradient in the cells to kind of do an assignment of the. To write, try to reconstruct the density in the cell, so like there should always always be linear gradients. Right, so you do a second order scheme. So also for the for the to calculate the fluxes, what you do is you have you have the in two cells the, the base quantities, density, velocity, pressure. Then you calculate the gradients in the cell from the neighbors, and then you reconstruct to the interface using these gradients. Yes. So when you say it's an intermediate, um, so you're allowing. You're allowing material both to flux in and out of cells, but you're keeping the but you're allowing the cells to to the cell boundaries to adjust as well. So that's what you mean by intermediate. Because Cartesian, I mean a, a, a usual grid-based code, right? It's not always the same mass in a cell. Whereas smooth particle, it's always the same mass, right? right basically. So we and in, in the kind of idea case, you would like have a very small kind of correction velocity, and you would be dominantly have like just the velocity of the gas. And then the code is almost diverging. Mm -hmm. It's still you have like little fluxes over the interface, um, but you kind of just take them into account, and then this leads to mass exchange and momentum exchange. Um, the yeah, so like kind of the, the you can like from a from a conceptual point of view, you can look at this as just kind of calculating fluxes on this static. Uh, unstructured mesh, mm -hmm. and then you have an additional flux that comes from moving the, the, the interfaces. It's just that in almost all, kinds, uh, all cases, these two fluxes almost cancel, kind of by construction, because you move the interface such that it moves with the flow. And then you have like much less, much lower like advection errors and dissipation and so on, because yeah, the, the, the absolute fluxes are just much lower. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about zones having very different masses and how that does or is or isn't similar to if you set up an SPH, a pure Lagrangian calculation with right. different masses. So, so the, the, um, the, yes, so the, in principle, the, you can, well, first you can in principle move the mesh in any arbitrary, right? So there's no, there's like, like, there are better and worse yeah. ways, but conceptually you can move it in any. And so you can also the mass of a cell can in principle increase and decrease yes. by an arbitrary. So what we do then to still kind of keep the mass resolution roughly the same is in addition to this, um, to kind of the just following the flow and so on, we also have like an AMR an explicit way of refining or de-refining cells. So we can add additional mesh generating points. Um, usually we do this like directly next to an existing one so that it just splits the cell in two. And then you just have continue on with two cells, and you can do this fully conservative. It also, as an AMR, when you do refinement, it drops to first order at this point. Um, and this, the same way it goes the other way around. We can also like remove mesh joining points, and then distribute the conserved quantities to the cells that then fill up the volume. Right. And so we usually do this actually um, more strictly than with AMR. So you re usually we, we set like for kind of our zeros le level, we set what we call a target gas mass, that's the mass the cells should have. And then once we are more than a factor of two away from this, we refine it even. <laughs> but in addition to this, same as AMR, we can also run, uh, we can also add any additional refinement criteria, right? So we can also refine right. our density or pressure gradients or in the outer layers. Yeah. 
Thanks. Um, yeah, so this, uh, similar to AMR, uh, you implement a second order of <coughs> volume scheme on this to calculate the fluxes. Um, one, dif one difference that's like, uh, that's, um, I would argue interesting is that in AMR, it actually has been demonstrated that you can, it's not trivial, but it's reasonably straightforward, go to higher order schemes. So PPM is slightly higher order, but you can also use a Wino method or something to go to fourth order, whatnot. You can use discontinuous Galerkin, which is like just a different way of doing, slightly different way of, do, of calculating the fluxes and doing your discretization to go to essentially arbitrary order with AMR. Um, this is, at least in practice, much harder with the unstructured mesh that's, um, that's, in, that's in a repo. And we have looked into this actually quite a bit, but we haven't really gotten anything that you can actually use for any practical purposes. Um, it has the same problem with uh, coupling hydrodynamics to gravity as any other AMR mesh code. So again, you don't, this, this is where some energy error usually comes in because this uh, yeah, coupling is not perfect and you're depending on whether you flow against like down the potential or up the potential, you, can, you usually get, you can get some kind of system error. Uh, yeah, it's intrinsically Galilean invariant because like, like at least if you chose the, if you ch start with the velocities of the cells as the gas velocity and then just do a correction that, that doesn't depend on the axial <coughs> velocity, then you can really show that like, if you boost the whole thing, you really get essentially identical. Um, one small or one small downside of this is that because you move your mesh turning points around and you have this correction velocities, one second, and um, there's always some kind of noise on the mesh scale that you can beat down by doing this better, but there's always some kind of noise. I've seen people claim that moving mesh uh, is third order accurate for the angular momentum. Uh, do you know like if this has been actually shown? You know who claims this? Like I know that our, that our repo isn't. Yeah, I think uh, in one of the gizmo papers. Gizmo. Okay, so then, then I wouldn't. So, so what's the actual <laughs> conservation of angular momentum if you use a repo? Hmm? What's the actual conservation of angular momentum if you use a repo? Um, it's, so fundamentally, it's also not perfectly conserved as with any mesh code, right? So the, the, main, the fundamental reason why this is, well, there are several reasons, but one of them is that like, like you kind of have only one average velocity quantity in every cell, and you can essentially choose whether you conserve the linear or the angular momentum. And usually, linear momentum is deemed uh, more important. But it, has it actually been shown that it's only second order? Um, I know I've looked in this, into this and, and test problems when I like repo initially was only first order, right? And so like I worked on this quite a bit to get it to second order. And so for something like the E vortex or so, was it like like the like all the things are second order, including angular. Okay. I don't remember. I, I, I remember I looked at angular momentum. I don't remember it significantly. But, but can you quantify what's the act? I mean, like after actual simulations, what? It um, well, this depends a lot on the simulation, and so it depends on the, on, yeah, it depends a lot of practice. Like, like, I don't think you can make any general statement as with the energy effort, right? Resolution helps a lot, but uh, yeah, in the end you need to monitor it, and then if it's if it's above a certain relative value, you should just not trust your simulation. So, yeah. so, so in Eulerian codes, the uh, lack of Galilean invariance at least comes partly because of the velocity dependence of the truncation error. Yes. And um, so if you're if you're using uh, mesh equations that aren't preserving it, making it exactly Lagrangian, um, is it still Galilean invariant in that case? And also, uh, when you do the remapping, don't you introduce dissipation there that would also make it not invariant? So we do for the, I think, yes, yeah, so, so the, Hardly true, but I don't like the way we do them. They do not break the Galilean invariance, right? So we have like, like the remapping, for example, um, introduces dissipation, but the like what it exactly does is is like exactly like two machine precision independent of bulk velocity. So it will not change the Galilean invariance. And um, similarly, the the Riemann solver actually that act that calculates the fluxes is a bit more tricky. And what we do there is that we calculate the the fluxes 
in the moving frame of the interface. And this also uh, kind of inherently guarantees the Galilean invariance. Like it's then slightly different things that you solve. And you can, in principle, also solve it in a lab frame and then like just add the action term from the mesh movement. But then, then it wouldn't be a Galilean invariance. But it actually turns out that this is actually really better, mostly because you, you have this cancellation in the mass flux that's like very small, right? And so if you would do this in the lab frame, then you have the a cancellation of two large terms. Mm -hmm. So we actually we have also tested this quite a lot because it's one of the things that we uh, it's, it's for de for debugging very helpful as well. Right? Like so, if you if you have a problem and you're not in entirely sure if there's an issue now or not, just boost it with a really high velocity. That's like many times the sound speed, right? and it really shouldn't change. If it changes, then you screw up something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Total energy and total momentum are only conserved approximately. Uh, one thing that's just a, a rough number, so in practice, to get to reasonable uh, uh, energy conservation in the calm envelope, it turns out we need to roughly resolve the pressure scale height by about 10 cells in the center of the simulation. Uh, additional physics, tu physics turns out to be, as mu to be much harder to implement than uh, on an AMR code. That's, in general, not an issue with a moving mesh. It's just an issue issue with, with the unstructuredness of the mesh, right? Because the like the number of uh, interfaces changes. There's no clear rule where you inter where your neighbors actually are, like relative to a cell, and <coughs> so yeah, anything that like yeah makes a lot of solvers just like more tricky. Uh, it's also if you if you are um, if you have issues with the regularization of the mesh so if you get like distorted cells uh, that also makes a lot of these more complicated solvers much more unsafe so we seem to have this uh, under control for magnetic fields nowadays and also for uh, radiation transport with uh, some kind of yeah with an m1 solver but uh, yeah it's, it's kind of you have to spend much much more effort in actually getting this to also, for AMR codes, for most of these, like, at least on this level of things, they're just recipes in literature of how to do this, while you can often use them as a starting point, but you still need to adapt them quite a bit to work on your And yeah, uh, in general, this comes back to the initial conditions I before. Uh, modeling the surface of a star is much harder in, but this is also true in generally in mesh codes than uh, with, with something like uh, SPH. Um, it's mostly because the, like, like at the surface, you always have some kind of unresolved pressure gradient into the background. And so you just tend to smear out the surface. And the question is then, how and where can you actually stabilize the mesh codes? And this uh, is also there are a lot of tricky things going in there. And yeah, so you like, we discussed this briefly in the simulation session or in the general session yesterday that usually you have some like very thin and hot envelope in the outside, but that also like Usually, you usually need to pay some price there as well. Right? Um, very carefully try to understand what's going on there if you want to analyze it, for example, for uh, uh, optical display of a transit. But it should be comparable to AMR, right? It's not that it's yes, yes, AMR. Yes, yes, yes. No, I completely agree, right? This is, it's a general problem of mesh codes. It's more, this is a big difference to how this works in SPH. When SPH, the surface is so kind of in SPH, the surface is more stable than you want it to be, and on mesh codes, it's less stable than you want it to be. So is it fair to say if you have constant mass elements, <coughs> essentially the surface is completely unresolved because you can't resolve below <coughs> a kernel worth of mass, right? Um, Wait, but what happens? So I agree that stability is more challenging, and it comes back to your pressure scale height criterion you have to resolve. The yes, so what, what, what happens in practice then in, in mesh codes is just, just like if you start with like a sharp jump in the pressure, it will just smear out the pressure, like it will just push out gas and smear this out until it's like resolved enough to actually be stable, right? Yes. To whatever this criterion yes. on your surface actually is, and you will then just get like a smooth transition that is at this criterion, right? It roughly tells you how, how many sets you So it's, 
In general, so the moving mesh is, uh, is kind of in between the AMR codes and the Lagrangian codes, right? So um, it's, uh, it's in some properties close to the Lagrangian codes, and in some properties uh, uh, close or like from, but from the kind of the, the hydro scheme in general, uh, from the from a, from a like discretization point of view, much closer. To Okay, so this already brings me to my summary. Um, I hope I could show you that like the different codes actually have like very different numerical properties, very different strengths and weaknesses. And in general, this is also uh, like it's very like if you if you would if you run a simulation with like two very different codes and get like quantitatively similar results, right? Then you can probably trust your result, these results much more than if you would do this just with one type of scheme or with one uh, type of code. Um, yeah, understanding the, uh, the critical points of your problem is like kind of important to decide which code is optimal. And then also for this, you first need to know what actually the strengths and the weaknesses are of your code or your scheme and like where it actually works well and where it doesn't work so well. Um, yeah, there's an open, there will be an open source version of Rapper soon, hopefully in a few weeks. So yeah. Like lots of people complained about limitations to availability of like moving mesh codes. Uh, this should be less of an issue then, hopefully. Although, uh, yeah, like so, we, like you mostly spend like you spend many months to clean up this code, like to clean up for the public version. Mm -hmm. um, it's still like much more complex than Get it Two, right? So if you if you have not downloaded Get it Two as an SPH code and ran this, uh, that's still way simpler than getting this. But we also added, like, this will have lots of examples and uh, kind of test cases where you can, whatever, set up a poly, like, there's an example to set up a polytrop so you can just see how to do this and how to, how to do things. And, yeah, so one of the things I thought about a little bit is that um, we call it, so, so one of the questions is always, like, to which degree does, like, does, does it, do you actually get rewarded if you go to higher order with your hydrodynamics? And so one of the problems is so the this is usually or the, the main criteria from when this can help is usually how many discontinuities discontinuities you have. Right? Because discontinuities are fundamentally first order jump. So if you're if you have lots of shocks in your simulation or lots of like true discontinuities of like strong shear flows or so, then um, higher order doesn't help you too much because you drop down and, and all of these con uh, discontinuities is the first order. However, the common envelope in general seems to be a smooth, like or for most of the volume seems to be a smooth problem. And so if you have a smooth problem, then in principle, going to higher order can actually so give you a much more efficient solution to a certain problem. So it would be interesting to look into to which degree that would actually be an interesting test case for higher order codes. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Well, I'm admiring the discussion, I guess. Uh, we're running a little over time, so maybe we'll have a 15 minute discussion and then we'll have a slightly over time on the coffee break. Okay, so go ahead. Um, I, I would just make two small comments. One, I think AMR codes also have the big advantage, especially if they're block based and good written by Defina, that if you measure speed as cells per second or particles per second per SPH, AMR codes are roughly in order of magnitude in my experience faster. It's not um, that much fast, but it's faster, right? It's well, because it you're... depends on the on the AMR method, I guess. <sighs> right. But the, the Athena is extremely fast. So they have this one advantage. And second of all, uh, so to just one one small sentence. Yeah. That's that's essentially because you know in which order which operations you need to do before, and because you know which interfaces where and where it goes on the other side, right? While on the moving mesh, like in every time step, the topology of the thing is different. So well, uh, that and you just the way computers work, you can yeah. vectorize much more efficiently. Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, second thing is it's kind of a personal thing for me. Um, I know a lot of people say that SPH is Lagrangian, but I'm not sure that's true because the smoothing kernel, whenever you actually want to calculate a physical quantity, which is like a primitive density, you're actually taking all the neighbors into account. So you are mixing particles, 
So I wouldn't call it a truly Lagrangian scheme in that sense. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with the point, but I think it's like semantics. It's <laughs> semantics unless you have these continuities. I think what, what actually an interesting conceptual point was like much more critical with SBH is the fact that uh, the the kernel is always spherical. Yeah. Because if you if you if you think about what a true Lagrangian method do if you have a she, would do if you have a shear flow, right? Then it like kind of distorts like a certain mass element and just stretches and stretches it and so on. And then at some point you have a super complicated like shape of your mass element. But because the kernel is always spherical, you essentially remap the, the volume of your mass element in every time step to a sphere without compensating for the exchange that you would do if you would kind of really go to the other volume. Yeah, so I have two questions. Um, well, there are two, two things which I find very important for common and low simulation. So first of them is angular momentum, because final orbital angular momentum of a full binary is usually less than a percent of initial angular momentum. And so my question is, if you will tell me roughly like, what is the angular momentum conservation in a repo at the end of common envelope simulation and how it compares to AMR, for me it will give whether well, I should start using a repo or not. Yeah, so I would have to check the exact numbers in Sebastian's simulation, I can tell you later. Um, I think it's percent or better or so. I think the angular momentum is like, so we looked at this, and we usually were not worried. We were usually worried about the, angle, uh, about the energy concentration. Right? So we usually stop the simulation when the energy arrow is just 10%. The same. I have a and at this point, the angular momentum is still good for us. I have a feeling that most of the errors come because of infection terms. The, the errors in angular momentum are because you get, have infection, but not from the uh, other uh, terms. And since in these codes you have less infection, I think you would have less of an error. I'm not sure about the order, but there might be a difference in the prefactor. Yes, no, it's, I think they're both second order in angular momentum conservation, yeah. in my experience. But yeah, so the prefactor is slightly better. And my second question is that. So I actually thought before that IMR, sorry, stop the moving mesh is closer to this page in terms of not, not having a boundary problem. But you said that they also have to deal with a hot vacuum or whatever it means. And the, the hot vacuum usually provides a problem with uh, if you take the bigger box and you have to remove a bigger mass of the hot vacuum, and it also shapes whatever it is, uh, the, whatever tries to be ejected from the common envelope. And then, so my question is that, is it uh, comparable to RMR, or it, you can deal with a smaller mass or whatever? I mean, is it more stable if you provide less of a hot vacuum? I, I really don't like I think, no, so, so I think Nobody I think, does. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, in this it's like very similar to AMR. But there might be slight differences that you that you probably um, have less diffusion on the surface as well. If you smear less, because also on the surface if it expands or contracts a little, it's mostly Lagrangian. But kind of the fundamental problem that you like somehow need to do something with the pressure gradient there is. Uh, is uh, yeah. um, just the, your last point, I think, is a good one. I'll take issue though about I think there's a lot of shocks in common envelope yeah. evolutions, or a lot of discontinuities. I mean, certainly you see all the spiral shocks happening, you know, during the later phases. Um, but I agree that the higher order, because what's are interesting. You sure for all of the simulations, these are true shocks. Um, there are discontinuities and yeah, yeah uh, not only shocks but discontinuities. It's worse people. if they're not shocks, right? It's they're worse if they're contacts. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think the point is that the higher order schemes, because the flows are both, you know, it's unlike uh, you know things where you have nice planar shocks or a supernova shock, because you have both shocks and then a lot of mixing behind them. And so the higher order scheme, I mean, I think that's something really to understand yeah. as we go deeper, is that, that the mixing of the flows, uh, you know, having a higher, having a third order scheme would be great for keeping that stuff from getting diffused away. Yeah, so. actually, oh. <laughs> we have a lot of So I, you know, talking of all these codes, I, in my work, have compared three directly, perhaps the only time they're being compared side to side in this way. And what is interesting is, surprisingly, they give very comparable results when you do these comparisons, 
minus some issues with the financing resolution between AMR and uh, SPH. But then you get lulled into a false sense of security because then all of us have done things within our own codes, like changing parameters by a little bit and realizing that things are actually really weird. So I could tell you right now that resolution matters or doesn't matter as to the final separation, right? Sometimes you think, well, it's surprisingly invariant, but then you realize in other conditions that you change your AMR levels of refinement and you go deeper. So it's worse. You can change the kernel for SPH. Mm -hmm. That will affect your output. Well, I've, I've actually tested that quite ex extensively, but on only one parameter set, right? And you change parameters, you go to massive stars, everything really changes. So with reference to what we were talking about yesterday of, you know, some, some master simulation that we all go to, I mean, I, I think that's advisable, but it's also questionable in that, yeah. you know, you go to slow, low mass, it's going to be really different. So yeah. I, I think this is a really great thing to achieve in these three days, to have some kind of guideline within which, it won't be perfect, but within which we can, yeah, I mean, it's really hard to decide what it is without huge amounts of work which, of course, nobody has time for. Just a, a comment also about this here. I think your Natasha made this comment yesterday about like, uh, like actually showing convergence. Just mm -hmm. like kind of the, the serious, like, and I think this is actually, this is usually is this very expensive to do, so it's yeah. not done very often. But the serious requirement, I would argue, to actually have, make a point that, it, that, that there's some indication for convergence yeah. is if you have your standard simulation, you ran it with a factor of two better spatial resolution Linear. and a factor okay. of four better spatial resolution, right? So there's a factor of eight and 64 in mass resolution. And then what you want to show is that the difference between the results actually gets smaller. Yeah. And that would be an indication for convergence. Can still trick your community. Great. But yes, so to follow up both on this point and something that I think you did a wonderful <laughs> job highlighting is maybe something to keep in mind is that, as you say on that uh, slide, that there isn't just one common envelope simulation and that uh, if we are as interested in a particular aspect of this big complicated uh, problem, then there might be different tools that are more optimal. And, and it's sort of critical to prove that the aspect that we're most interested in at a given moment is uh, you know, there's indications that that's validated uh, in the method that we're using. Not just that, like, I think that what Ursula is alluding to is that if we just prove that we can do a test case and then go crazy, we haven't proved that the thing that we're trying to measure is also. Yeah, it also so, which yeah thanks for highlighting that here. It's usually people say that individual simulation more common. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll ask something Maybe more so. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about hybrid scheme. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's straightforward to do it. There's a little um, in there. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's 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 true. Lots of hard work. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, we actually yeah. have, we have worked with metricians for quite a while on this. Right. And so the, yeah, so the, the main thing we actually are looking at there is the discontinuous good looking. Yep. Where you kind of have higher order basis functions in a cell and then you have like more information about the internal structure. Right. And then you also only need the direct neighbors to calculate the process. Um, the main problem, and this is mathematically like turns out to quickly becomes tricky, is that uh, one of the one of the fundamental assumptions of discontinuous good working is that you split the problem into uh, into uh, basis functions that only depend on the spatial structure and then coefficients that give you like waiting for these patient hubs that evolve with time. Right. Now, the, if the mesh changes in every time step, right. then the first assumption is immediately broken, right? And so you, then you need to also evolve these basis functions, and that can become very, very tricky. Right. In particular, to not lose right. order with this thing, right? Like, so you, then you really need to like kind of, uh, kind of time resolve smoothly how the topology of the mesh changes right. during a time step. The second question related to that, that usually when you do high order schemes spatially, what you also need to do high order schemes in time as well. Now, in uh, moving mesh codes, this comes up high price. Yeah. Because uh, one of the things that you show, right, was that basically um, you do not account for the mesh motion uh, during your scheme, you're going to get worse order results, right? So if you go to high order schemes, you have to basically 
put on the mesh. Uh, more time for work time is then. Um, and so the question is that work the cost versus basically just drawing just for the channel. But I think like for for a second order at least, yeah, you, you, try, you can still do it with the uh, one mesh construction here. Yeah. And I think in that claims that or the, I think, no. Yeah. For arbitrary order, you can, you can but it, it, will, it won't be so stable. So the thing is, if you do like a run with a time step, yeah. uh, forget the formal definition of it. Uh, there's like a stable way and unstable way. And the stable way I mean is that your end product is just a weighted summation of different states. And there's like a, the midpoint method where you <coughs> take up fluxes from one sub-cycle and but the uh, conserved variable from is different. So the, uh, this unstable, I found a way where you can do only one mesh construction, actually. Okay. And go to arbitrary high sub uh, time steps. But it's not so stable in my uh, experience. Uh, the only way to get it to actually be stable is to actually do more mesh constructions. All right. Um, yeah. Oh, I see. So you have to linearly interpolate that in order to get the. Because basically, it's a question like. What, what, are the, what, are, what are the other order fluxes? So you have to be interpolate in order to get all the fluxes, the other uh, steps. So like every sub uh, time step, you just do the fluxes. Kind of like using the original mesh. Either the original mesh or the mesh at the end of the time step. So your, your mesh like jumps in the middle of the time step. The right. So basically, you, you yeah. start with uh, your first order time step. Then you construct the mesh for the next time step. And then you calculate new concern variables, calculate fluxes on it, evolve again. You keep on using the old mesh, but just changing the concern variables. Or, or either the old or the new one. Okay. And that actually, that actually is higher order time. Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah, formally it should give you. Right? Yeah. But one thing I think that's in general interesting, interesting about this is that if you go to higher order, it seems to be much more critical to do this in space than in time. Yeah. Even if you do like high order DG or so, yeah. um, if you, you can go to like fifth, six, or I think we have tried fourth order, but you don't like your, your error still like your, uh, still like your absolute error still goes down a lot without going to necessarily equal time integration. Okay. So uh, so Adam was right that you know shocks are important as well as uh, smooth flow where you get turbulence and that obviously can be important for energy transport, but. Um, so I was wondering to what extent uh, you think that uh, variable order schemes like we know uh, would be a good direction to go rather than a fixed order with uh, DG or something like that. But also with DG, you can in principle you can do vary the order. Refine, right? Just decide for every cell to which order. Uh -huh. like, um, I think that the problem that the problem really comes down to like what kind of the typical volume fraction of your discontinuity is, right? And so if you of course, you want to then go. Yeah, you automatically go and you try to take this to go to, to go to lower order where you have these discontinuities. But this, you kind of, if you think about, if there's regularly some discontinuities sweeping over your like high order solution, not not much of it will be le will be left, right? Like you can just like lose information there. So I think it's it's really the question is like how like how much does this interact and so. Well, presumably that's not such a problem with uh, moving mesh schemes, right? Because uh, discontinuity moves with the mesh, right? No, it gas moves. Oh, sure, right. You're right. Yeah. Right. So that's for for for, for shocks that doesn't work. For shear flow, that yeah, might yeah, still be yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, Contact would, but yeah. a, a contact yeah. would. But yeah, con a contact is much better. Yeah, contact is just general in the moving mesh much right. better than for, for a given resolution. You get just get much less yeah. issues there. But yeah, shocks are. Well, I, okay, I could talk to you about it later. I mean, there's, there are test problems that you know do have shocks going through uh, you know, smooth this, material yeah. that um, that you know schemes like we know seem to do well. Yeah. Yeah.